What's your favorite creepy campfire story? Part 2, relax and enjoy the stories. If you're entertained, hit subscribe and spread the word about Thread Tonic. Account 1. Gotta apologize if I don't do it justice. I only heard it told once years back. We were on a scout trip in northern Utah. Was a short trip with some light hiking, fishing, merit badge work, etc. According to the scout leader, the place was called Mirror Lake. And he had an old friend who'd camped out there before, some 25 years before. This friend was there with two other guys, all in their mid-twenties. I can't remember the names, so we'll say they were Steve, Mike, and Jacob. They had a very tame fishing trip. No alcohol or any other substance that could have upped the chances that events were being misremembered, misinterpreted, scary when it wasn't, etc. But on the final night of the trip, they'd called it a night, settled in for bed, and Steve fell asleep. Not long later, he and Mike woke up in the tent to a noise in the distance, presumably an animal echoing from across the lake. As they came to, they noticed Jacob was missing. At first, they didn't assume anything was wrong. He was probably just going to the bathroom and would be back any minute. But as they waited, they gradually got more uneasy and worried. Eventually, they decided to go find him, as they were just beginning their search of the near area. But before they started calling his name out as loud as they could, they heard an ear-splitting, inhuman screech, followed by Jacob's blood-curdling scream. Scared out of their wits, they rushed back to their tent. With hushed voices and tears in their eyes, survival became the primary concern. They prayed that whoever or whatever had their friend had happened upon him while he was out looking for a spot to go to the bathroom so it wouldn't known where their tent was. The plan became to sleep in shifts through the night and get back to the city at the first sign of light and inform the officials so they could hopefully save Jacob E. or whatever remained of him. Things went well for the first few shifts. So they began to relax and hope that they would survive the night began to grow. The time came again for Steve to rest, and this time he was able to fall asleep more quickly and sleep more deeply with his mind less on edge and the fatigue piling up. But not long later, he was roused from his sleep as Mike was rustling around the tent. Steve sat up and saw that Mike was getting his shoes on. He asked him where he was going, but Mike didn't respond or acknowledge his question. Concern growing as the grogginess faded and the situation came back to him, Steve got out of his sleeping bag and grabbed his friend by the shoulder. When he faced Mike head on, his face was blank, but his eyes were wide and glazed over, as reflective as a mirror or as the lake. He was muttering something about needing to go and continued getting ready to leave the tent almost in a trance. Steve thought he was just tired and not being careful, so he tried to talk him out of going out saying to wait till it was light so they could pack up and hike back to the car. But Mike kept ignoring him. As Steve started to get a little more rough with Mike to try to shake him out of it, they heard a noise much the same as the one they heard before, but not nearly as far as across the lake. This was the first thing that got Mike's attention, and his whole body went tense as the flashlight reflected off his glossed eyes, and he began to rush, seeming to be in a hurry to get out of the tent and join whatever was out there. Steve went into full panic mode, unsure of what to do, but he was resolved to not let Mike go out there and be taken or killed as Jacob had. He was trying to hold Mike back, but Mike struggled against him, unshakable in his trance. Mike broke free and began to unzip the main entrance when Steve tackled him away, pinning him down with his body weight and clamping a hand over Mike's mouth in case he tried to call the thing over. For what felt like years, Steve stayed there, barely dating to breathe, resisting Mike's attempts to wriggle free or speak, sure that he hadn't come back to himself yet. Finally, as the light of morning began to work its way through the trees, Mike stopped struggling, and the mirror left his eyes. Steve asked him why he had been trying to leave, but Mike had no memory of this. In a flurry, they broke down their camp, basically sprinted through the winding trail back to their car, and sped till they could get cell reception to call the police. I never asked my scout leader after the trip if he really knew a guy that claimed this stuff had really happened, or if he'd just made it up come across the story from someone else telling it. But he was a smart guy, so I could see him coming up with it on the spot to make it feel real and tied to where we were camping to freak us out. I was definitely unsettled, but some of the other boys were scared out of their minds. Later that night, we were settling in to go to bed when we realized one boy had fallen asleep in the tent while we'd all been chatting. 
So we were cruel enough to all leave the tent and then try to wake him up and make him think we'd all been taken under the mirror's trance. He was pretty scared for about two minutes before someone gave it up and went and told him. But if it had been up to me, I'd have held out and let him freak out a while longer. This was an awesome question and a great thread to read and get me thinking back to this and other great camping trips. Account 2. This is a pretty common one, but it always scared the crap out of my little cousins. Here it goes. There once was a girl named Mary Sue. She would always wear a bow around her neck. The kids at school would always say, Mary Sue, Mary Sue, take off that bow, will you? But she refused. In high school, her best friends asked her to take it off as they had gone out of fashion, but Mary Sue refused. One day, Mary Sue met the man of her dreams, and he asked her to take off her bow, but she replied, One day you will find out. Almost 60 years later, after Mary Sue's children had grown up and moved out, Mary Sue went up to her husband. Do you want to see what is under my bow? She asked. Her husband put down his newspaper. Are you sure? You've never taken it off. I am sure, my love, Mary Sue said, pulling the end of her bow. The bow fell to the ground shortly followed by her head, then the rest of her body. Account 3. There were a couple that were, as far as I know, unique to the church camp, Camp Gaylor Maxson, I went to as a kid. Though I admit it's possible some of our stories were ubiquitous ones just adapted to the place, I don't really know. One of them, though, I do have first-hand knowledge about. It's the story of Sydney. The camp was established on an old piece of property that has been a lot of different things over the years. Back during the war, it was a girls' boarding school. One girl who was there was deeply in love with a boy who had gone off to fight. They exchanged letters constantly until one day the letters stopped coming. A few weeks later, she gets word that her beloved was killed in action. She was so distraught that she hanged herself in her dorm room. There's still a plaque by the door of the room in her memory. Now I know for a fact that room is haunted. I stayed in that room one year when I worked for the camp. One night after lights out, the fan came on by itself. It started spinning faster and faster until it started wobbling really hard, acting like it's about to fall off. I knew the stories, so I shouted, Stop it, Sydney! I'm a friend! Fan immediately stopped. Like not just slowed down and came to an eventual stop. It's like someone grabbed the fan blades and stopped it. Account 4. Typical Filipino Stories Almost all schools are Catholic schools in my country, and they're either built over a cemetery and or used to be a barracks and hospital during WW2. Maria Labo. Though I think this one is just from our island, but I do remember reading about it in a national horror magazine, so it must have spread. Poor woman goes to London to work as a caregiver. She comes back as an aswang ogul. Cooks up her children, her husband finds out and slices her face with a labo or machete. Now she roams the countryside searching for her next meal. This caused so much panic in my town that the radio station had to issue a statement that it was just a folk tale. Tianak. If you're out hiking in the woods during dusk or night and you hear a baby crying, do not help it. Just run away. It will eat you. Account 5. I've been telling this one since I was little. I love it. I hope you enjoy. It's not super scary, but it's nice and spooky, so hopefully you'll still like it. I work in the Nevada desert. A little facility out in the middle of nowhere. To get home, it's about an hour drive of pretty much nothing. One day driving home, my car ran out of gas. I've always wondered if this dreaded day would come, and here we are. I had no choice but to start walking. I always drove past this little roadside motel, so I guess I don't have much of a choice. I walked a couple miles until I got to it. I asked the front desk if they had any gas I could use. They said yes, but it would cost me. It was way too expensive. I didn't even have enough on me, so I had no choice but to clean dishes and do other odd jobs around the place for the rest of the night. By the end, I had made enough money, but I was completely beat. No way I could drive after that. I asked if I could at least use a room for the night. Not wanting to cause an accident, the owner said yes. Thank God. Although what he said after surprised me, to say the least. We have two rooms available. One's haunted, and there's another next to it. I laughed it off, figuring it was just him messing with me after the long day friendly jokes. Just to be safe, I chose the room next to it. When I got in there, what a dump. Just a shitty table with a shitty bed and a shitty broken fridge. I sat down on the bed, exhausted. 
I looked up to see there was a hole in the wall about the size of a coin. Wow. How classy. Out of curiosity, I looked through the hole with one eye. I saw the room next to mine. At the table, a young woman was seated brushing her long brown hair. She was beautiful, from the back at least. I didn't want to be a creep, so I just went to bed. A couple hours later, I woke up with an uncomfortable feeling, just in the pit of my stomach that something wasn't quite right. I sat up and saw the hole in the wall was now glowing. I kneeled back down to it and peered through. All I could see was red, bright glowing red. I figured the woman had just placed something, I don't know, an electronic in front of the hole. I went back to bed, unable to shake the feeling. The next morning when I woke up, I headed straight to the front desk to get all paid so I could get the hell out. As I got the gas, I decided to ask the owner. Hey, that woman in the room next to mine, is she all right? I was getting kind of a bad feeling. The owner laughed at me. Oh, so you saw her. She's the haunted room's resident. I laughed it off again, trying to continue to joke around with sarcasm. Well, she's awfully pretty for a ghost. The owner handed me the gas tank. Then you haven't seen her from the front. Her eyes are glowing red. Account 6. 100 years ago, out in the waters around Spivey Point, a small clipper ship drew toward land. Suddenly, out of the night, the fog rolled in. For a moment, they could see nothing, not a foot in front of them. Then they saw a light. By God, it was a fire burning on the shore, strong enough to penetrate the swirling mist. They steered a course toward the light but it was a campfire, like this one. The ship crashed against the rocks, the hull sheared in two, masts snapped like a twig. The wreckage sank with all the men aboard. At the bottom of the sea lay the Elizabeth Dane, with her crew, their lungs filled with salt water, their eyes open, staring to the darkness. And above, as suddenly as it come, the fog lifted, receded back across the ocean, and never came again. But it is told by the fishermen and their fathers and grandfathers that when the fog returns to Antonio Bay, the men at the bottom of the sea, out in the water by Spivey Point, will rise up and search for the campfire that led them to their dark, icy death. Account 7. My father was a man of extensive creative talents, prone to the odd tale of whimsy and horror as the mood might take him. I recall one story in particular, seared into my memory and piercing the veil of time to visit me on occasion even now. It spoke of a civilization that hung on the precipice, how the city teetered on the edge of disaster, the waves of destruction crashing into the shoals beneath the cliff it resided upon. All of the people in this civilization saw the threat, were fully aware of the impending doom, but they did nothing to halt its progress. The challenge resided in their need to rely upon each other, to place the concerns of the future above the trivial but more immediate desires of the present. They consoled themselves by protesting that the city upon the cliff had stood for generations, and it had never fallen into the sea. Surely it would last for a generation longer. There was no need to change their behavior now, with history being so eloquent an excuse to continue as they had. And so they built as those who had come before them had built. The buildings grew higher. The wells bored deeper. The people and their things became ever more numerous. Each person added the merest feather to the load, and each believed their feather could surely not be responsible for any consequences. It was but a feather. A feather would not break the earth, could not be the final burden which broke the soil beneath the city and caused it to tumble into the sea. Besides, why should they give up their feathers if others did not? And so each person lived as they desired heedless of the cracks slowly winding their way up the pavement, careless of the small quakes the rumbled beneath. They paid no mind to these inconvenient harbingers, for there were things to build, desires to fulfill, dreams to live that could not be forestalled in favor of imagined nightmares far off. The city grew and grew, each living for themselves, a great collection of individuals but not a society, a civilization of humans without humanity. Feather upon feather was added. Then came the final feather. A great groan sounded out, and the world began to tilt and shift. Screeching pierced the night as the tip of the cliff sheared off, dooming the city on the hill to the death of the sea below. In the briefest of moments, 
The project of generations was reduced to ruins, and a great future of possibility was lost. I called out to my father, wondering why the people would fail to heed the warnings, wondering why they would give up so much in service of so little. He leaned forward and laid a hand on my shoulder, his eyes sad and distant, and he whispered, That, my child, is the way people are. Account 8. Why I'm no longer a park ranger. When I was a park ranger, I usually worked the day shift, but there had lately been a lot of night shift guys quitting. It was obviously inevitable that I would be asked to do night shift. I arrived at the watchtower at 5 p.m. The watchtower was next to one of those large ponds or small lakes. I climbed up the stairs to the top and entered the tower room. There was one clear glass wall and three wooden opaque walls. Inside was a bed with a nightstand next to it on the right. There was also a kitchenette with two sets of cabinets on the left-hand side. Next to the glass wall on the far side of the room was a radio communication station. On the nightstand was a flashlight. Inside the nightstand were a pair of binoculars and a long-range walkie-talkie. Inside the small cabinets was food. I couldn't open the big cabinets for some reason. There was most likely stuff in there that were above my pay grade. Around the watchtower room was a walkway. Anyways, I went to the communication station and radioed my partner, Donnie, who was at the main ranger station. I said, well, Donnie, it looks like it's just us tonight. He didn't reply, though, so I assumed he was in the bathroom. So I took the binoculars and walkie-talkie and stepped onto the walkway. I scanned the far ridge, the roads, and the forest below. I was looking for illegal campsites, troublemakers, and other riffraff. As I passed my binoculars across the far ridge, I saw what looked like a snowman. I had a double take and thought, a snowman? In the middle of July? I looked again and saw that it wasn't a snowman, but a kid wearing a ghost costume, just staring at the watchtower. The costume was a sheet pulled over with two eye holes cut out, like the ghost costumes in Charlie Brown. So I radioed Donnie again and asked, Hey Donnie, are you there? Donnie responded, Yeah, I just made it out. I got a chuckle out of that. Donnie was always good for a laugh. I then said, Yeah. Say, can you check out the ridge? I saw a kid up there wearing a ghost costume. You know, a sheet with eye holes cut out. You mean like from Charlie Brown Halloween? He asked. Yes. Donnie then left the ranger station and headed for the ridge. About 40 minutes later, the sun had set and it was a bit dark. I scanned the ridge again, but the kid in the ghost costume was gone. So I radioed Donnie again. Are you there? Donnie responded, I'm almost at the ridge. What's up? I said, you might want to search the surrounding area the kid has moved. Sure thing. About 10 minutes later, I saw Donnie's flashlight shining on the ridge in the distance. I looked in my binoculars and saw Donnie shining the light around and Donnie shrugging. He then radioed me and said, I don't see anyone H. Donnie's flashlight then went out and there was just static on the radio. I spoke into the radio. Donnie, 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 are you there? What happened? Just then I heard a loud shriek coming from the base of the tower. I shined my flashlight down and saw, right between the tower and the pond, a pale blue woman with empty eye sockets staring at me. All of her limbs looked broken and bent in the wrong way. Just then, she started sprinting up the stairs towards the top where I was. I had never seen anyone move that fast. She was running faster than Olympic runners. I freaked out, ran inside, grabbed the biggest kitchen knife I could find, locked the door, and hid next to it. There was no way she could run up those steps that fast, even if her limbs weren't broken. Then I heard the sound of one of the big cabinets opening. My blood ran cold. I slowly looked over at the cabinets to see one of the big ones wide open with the ghost from the ridge looking right at me. I froze in fear. That is, until I heard it giggling. I recognized that giggle. I pulled off the sheet and saw it was one of Donnie's kids. He pulled out a walkie-talkie and said, Hey, Dad, we got him. I heard Donnie's voice come over the radio. Ha, 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 good job. I grabbed that walkie-talkie and said, Ha-ha, very funny, you jerk. Donnie replied, Yeah, listening to you scream like a girl was the best bit. I responded, Yeah, screw you too, Donnie. Ew. By the way, that wasn't me who screamed. That was that zombie chick at the stairs. Who was that, your wife? Donnie hesitated in responding and just stuttered out, M-my wife? 
Do ghosts look like zombies from that from that distance? You said it yourself. It looked like a Charlie Brown ghost. I then said, not the ghosts. There was a woman at the bottom of the tower. She shrieked and ran up the stairs faster than an Olympic runner. Donnie then said, uh, yeah, I didn't put a woman on the stairs. Needless to say, I put in my resignation when my shift was over. Account 9. Longtime favorite, invented by my adolescent sons with their cousins and friends, mostly boys. Prerequisite, it must be dark. All must have had a good dinner, s'mores and it's past bedtime. Adults require adult beverages for this. Here's how it goes. One person starts the story, preferably an adult who can put the creepy theme in at the onset. The rules are, you can only have one sentence that builds from the previous spoken storyline. You say your sentence and it's the next person's turn, around the circle encompassing the fire pit. There are no rules for how it ends, but it usually ends up with something something penis and middle school giggles and buzzed adults having side stories that are relevant and above the children's understanding or hearing, hard to do with imbibing adults. After six or so years of this, we gathered around the fire and Johnny started with this one. That ended it all. There once was a guy, all the adults shouted, ah, who had a giant penis? And that was that. We came to the end of the free willy talk, discovered our kids were more adult-like, and adjusted our fire talk. Sorry for the long story. I get nostalgic with all these guys graduating from college these days. Good times. Account 10. I don't know if this will be seen, but hoping one or two people see this. For starter, our house is from the 1800s, and we've been renovating it for the last 3.5 years, and we've heard that a previous owner died here. One night, I was coming downstairs to get a glass of water when I saw a white figure floating about an inch off the ceiling, which is 8 FT tall. I was a little shaken up, and I run upstairs and back to bed. About a year later, my parent bought a camper with a built-in radio. After about two months of having the camper, the radio in it, mysteriously turned on, my dad heard it and then turned it off. Then a few days later, the radio turned back on, and the cycle repeated until the battery died. After a year after the radio kept going off, I had finally moved into my bedroom after it was finished. One night I was watching YouTube, and I heard a shushing noise when all of my family was asleep. I heard the shushing noise a few times after that. The last thing that had happened was in July. I was on a FaceTime call with one of my friends, and I was fidgeting with some coins I had. I stood one up on its edge and was going to stand another one up. But I'd fell too many times, so I gave up and swiped it onto the floor. After that, I went downstairs to refill my water bottle because my mouth was dry from talking. I go back upstairs. About five minutes later, I went back upstairs to find the coin that was on the floor back on my desk, standing on its edge. I went downstairs and asked if anyone had gone up to my room, and everybody said no. So I went back up to my room and heard that same shushing sound. Now one of my best friend has been telling me that he's been hearing a shushing sound occasionally when he's home alone. Account 11. A man and a girl go out to drive under moonlight. They stop on the side of road. He turns to his girl and says, Baby, I love you very much. What is it, honey? Our car is broken down. I think the engine is broken. Ill walk and get some more fuel. Okay, I'll stay here and look after our stereo. There have been news report of stereos being stolen. Good idea. Keep the doors locked no matter what. I love you, sweetie. So the guy left to get full for the car. After two hours, the girls say, Where is my baby? He was supposed to be back by now. Then the girl hears a scratching sound and a voice saying, let me in. The girl doesn't do it and then after a while she goes to sleep. The next morning she wakes up and finds her boyfriend still not there. She gets out to check and man door hand hook car door. Account 12. I love this one short and just creepy enough. I had a roommate friend of mine in college, decided one summer to solo hike through a bunch of Colorado. He's kinda odd. He's one of those kind of people that automatically thinks old stuff is better, that will only takes photos on film, and has a ridiculous record collection. But he's also a pretty experienced camper, so no one was very worried about him. It's kind of a soul-searching thing for him. But anyway, he goes off for two months and he comes back and he's telling me about his trip. 
It was amazing, just out in nature, so many stars, that kind of stuff. And also, there were a couple days I felt like I was being watched, but I never met anyone on the trail. Super weird. I even thought I saw someone, but nope. A couple days later, he gets his photos from the local film developer he uses. And he gets back to the apartment and shows me the photos like he always does. But he seems off. I'm looking through the photos, and there are beautiful landscapes, his camp set up, his breakfast. And then right in the middle of there are four photos of him in his sleeping bag. Sleeping. Account 13. It was a cold, dreary night, with misting rains and a chilling breeze. Me and any my uncle were coming back from visiting our cousin who lived upstate. With another 20 miles to get home, we pulled off the interstate and started down a rural stretch of highway that led to our small town. Just off the edge of the interstate exit ramp, we saw a man standing in the cold rain with a bag over his shoulder and his thumb out, trying to hitch a ride. My uncle pointed the man out. Look at that poor son of a bitch. I looked at my uncle. Should we give him a ride? My uncle shrugged his shoulders. I pulled the car to side and the man jogged up to our window. Where are you headed, buddy? Elmdale, the man said. Elmdale was a tiny town about 15 miles up the highway. Most of the town died out after the Great Depression. There wasn't much left but a few scattered houses and the county cemetery. We agreed to give the man a ride and he climbed into the back seat of our car. My uncle and I were both pretty tired, so we didn't try to make conversation. We just drove in silence. That is, until we heard giggling in the back seat. We looked in the rearview mirror. The hitchhiker had his bag, a green canvas army surplus style pack opened up. We couldn't see what was inside, but he was staring into it with a big smile on his face. He whispered into the bag, shh, I know soon enough they'll see. And then he giggled again. By this time, he notices we are looking in the rearview mirror at him. He hastily closes the bag and looks out the window like nothing's happened. My uncle asks, Hey, buddy, what's in the bag? The hitchhiker gets an enraged look on his face. None of your damn business. Me and my uncle exchange glances. Maybe this was a bad idea. A ride in silence for a few more miles. I speed up to try and get to Elmdale faster so we can get this creep out of our car. Then we hear the whispering again. Close now, darling, won't be long. Be ready when the time comes. Again, we see that he's got his bag open and is talking down into it. I clear my throat and say, Do you have a pet in that bag or something? The hitchhiker looks bewildered. A pet? He starts looking around the car. No, I mean in your bag. What's in your bag? The hitchhiker stares defiantly back at me in the rear view mirror. None of your damned business. I push the gas pedal down further, up ahead, through the rain. I can see the edge of the county cemetery coming into view. We are close. The hitchhiker starts laughing. It's a maniacal laugh, like the kind you'd hear echoing down the hall of a psych ward. He's got his bag open, starring down inside. I hear my uncle say, fuck this, and it's all the encouragement I need. I break hard and pull the car roughly onto the shoulder. We are just outside the cemetery gates. I throw the transmission in park and yell, get the fuck out of the car! My uncle springs from his seat. In a second, he's out his door and ripping open the rear passenger door. He grabs the hitchhiker and yanks him out. The hitchhiker shrieks and pulls a box cutter from his jacket. Just as he extends the blade, my uncle punches him in jaw. The hitchhiker stumbles back and takes a hard fall into a seated position. Instantly, my uncle and I are back in the car. I throw the transmission in drive and floor it. We pull away, and in the rear view, I can see the hitchhiker. He's spinning in the road, slashing air with his box cutter, shrieking at the top of his lungs. In a matter of seconds, he fades from view. The car is up to speed, and he is long gone. In the confusion, my uncle wasn't able to close the rear door. The momentum has partially pressed it closed, but it rattles, slightly ajar. My uncle reaches over the seat to pull it shut. Oh, shit, he says. What? He left his bag in the back seat. We exchange glances as he pulls the bag into the front seat. Hesitantly, he pulls the flap open. His hand freezes in place, his eyes bulge. Holy shit! I ask him what it is, but he's unable to speak. Instead, he turns the bag toward me and pulls the flap all the way open so that I finally peer inside. And do you know what was in that bag? 
None of your damn business. Account 14. 36 400,000. That is the expected number of intelligent civilizations in our galaxy, according to Drake's famous equation. For the last 78 years, we had been broadcasting everything about us, our radio, our television, our history, our greatest discoveries, to the rest of the galaxy. We had been shouting our existence at the top of our lungs to the rest of the universe, wondering if we were alone. 36 million civilizations, yet in almost a century of listening, we hadn't heard. We were alone. That was until about five minutes ago. The transmission came on every transcendental multiple of hydrogen's frequency that we're listening to. Transcendental harmonics, things like hydrogen's frequency times pi, don't appear in nature, so I knew it had to be artificial. The signal pulsed on and off very quickly with incredibly uniform amplitudes. My initial reaction was that this was some sort of binary transmission. I measured 1679 pulses in the one minute that the transmission was active. After that, the silence resumed. The numbers didn't make any sense at first. They just seemed to be a random jumble of noise. But the pulses were so perfectly uniform and on a frequency that was always so silent, they had to come from an artificial source. I looked over the transmission again and my heart skipped a beat. 1679, that was the exact length of the Arecibo message sent out 40 years ago. I excitedly started arranging the bits in the original 73x23 rectangle. I didn't get more than halfway through before my hopes were confirmed. This was the exact same message. The numbers in binary, from 1 to 10. The atomic numbers of the elements that make up life. The formulas for our DNA nucleotides. Someone had been listening to us and wanted us to know they were there. Then it came to me, this original message was transmitted only 40 years ago. This means that life must be at most 20 light years away. A civilization within talking distance? This would revolutionize every field I have ever worked in. Astrophysics, astrobiology, astro. The signal is beeping again. This time, it is slow. Deliberate, even. It lasts just under five minutes, with a new bit coming in once per second. Though the computers are, of course, recording it, I start writing them down. Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero. I knew immediately this wasn't the same message as before. My mind races through the possibilities of what this could be. The transmission ends, having transmitted 248 bits. Surely this is too small for a meaningful message. What great message to another civilization can you possibly send with only 248 bits of information? On a computer, the only files that small would be limited to. Text. Was it possible? Were they really sending a message to us in our own language? Come to think of it, it's not that out of the question. We had been transmitting pretty much every language on Earth for the last 70 years. I begin to decipher with the first encoding scheme I could think of. ASCII. Zero. One. Zero. One. Zero. One. Zero. Zero. That's B. Zero. One. One, zero, zero, one, zero, one, A. As I finish piecing together the message, my stomach sinks like an anchor. The words before me answer everything. Be quiet or they will hear you. Account 15. I got one. I was deer hunting near Huna, Alaska with my dad. One night I have this weird dream. I see these beautiful white deer, buck and doe. I mean like the type you take and get stuffed. I take a couple of shots. The buck gets away but the doe falls over, dead. After skinning it up and going back to my truck, I hear a noise. As I turn, I see the buck again, but this time he looks angry. He looked beautiful the first time, this time? Nightmare fuel. We're talking flaming red eyes. Antlers crawling into the sky, and his once white fur was covered in blood. As he charged, I screamed and then woke up. I never forgot that dream. On a later camping trip, to a different location, as the fire grew dim... I decided to tell this dream as a campfire story. As I finished with, it was scary, but I'm glad it was just a dream, my dad speaks up and tells me, son, that was the Hunah ghost deer. That's an actual myth told by the natives there. I was pretty shook hearing that.